very welcome this afternoon to our historical fiction event. My name is Tanya Farrelly. I am the director of Bray Literary Festival. I am delighted to be joined today by Martina Devlin and Pauline Cooney, who are going to discuss their latest novels with me. So the first thing I'm going to do is to introduce the two ladies. So Pauline is an award-winning author. She was raised in the Irish Midlands. She has a BA in History, Sociology and English and did an MLit on Charlotte Bronte and has an MA in Creative Writing. In 2017, she left a teaching career to concentrate full-time on writing. Her debut novel, Charlotte and Arthur, was published in 2021. And when not writing, I believe she can be found weeding in the garden, walking and watching quiz shows. So thank you, Pauline, for joining us today. And secondly, we have Martina Devon, Martina has written 11 books and two plays and is an award-winning journalist. She has won the V.S. Pritchett Prize from the Royal Society of Literature and the Hennessy Literary Award. Martina presents the City of Books podcast for Dublin UNESCO City of Literature and is the first holder of a PhD in literary practice from Trinity College in Dublin, where she has taught Irish literature. So thank you very much for joining us today, Martina. So ladies, we're here to discuss your two most recent novels, your first novel, in fact, mm -hmm. Pauline. Um, and as I say, you have 11 books before that, uh, Martina. So um, I think with historical fiction, the first thing is, especially with bio, biographical historical fiction, um, there has to be something about that person that really grabs you and doesn't let you go, and you feel that you need to write about them. Um, I know in your case, Pauline, as I just read out there, you have an M lit in the work of Charlotte Bronte, but I think it's one thing enjoying a writer's work. It's another thing entirely to decide to write about their life, and also to decide to do it in a fictitious way, as opposed to a straight biography. So would you like to talk to us a little bit uh, about your obsession with Charlotte Bronte and why you decided to write a fictional account of her honeymoon. Okay, um, so maybe to take the last part, you know, why fiction and that um, I remember when I was doing the Emlet on Charlotte Bronte and my very patient supervisor was Margaret Kelleher in Minute and um, Margaret a few times and I'm looking back now realising she must have been quite frustrated with me because she said you know you have to kind of stick to the facts <laughs> so I obviously was delving a little bit in into fiction in, in the way I was presenting my material so and she often said to me you know I think you should do something in a fictitious way mm. about that so that was kind of where the seed was sown but as regards Charlotte Bronte, when I was um, 15, I was on holidays with my grandmother over in Yorkshire visiting relatives and they brought us to Howarth and then I just became uh, interested, I won't say obsessed then, but I became interested um, in the, the Brontes. I remember Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights was very big at the time and, and Wuthering Heights was the first book I read. but. It was always like looking at their life story and um, it was always Charlotte who fascinated me. I think she got bad rap a lot of the time um, because she was the one, like she was the businesswoman in the family. While they were all literary, um, she was the one that wrote to the publishers, did all the deals, got them all published in many ways and and then, you know, as I said, got bad rap for that, like people said that she was a bit of a bully but when it came to Emily and the poetry and how that came about. Um, and I just really, yeah, I, I liked Charlotte Bronte um, and I felt that the, the aspect of her that never got addressed was the honeymoon and the marriage. It was always and the, the Irish connection. The Irish connection, yeah. but it was always like the addendum because she got married and then nine months later she was dead. So um, it was something that I, I just wanted to address. I suppose like any gap that you find in history, you know, you just wanted to, to, to fill it in. Do you feel there's a particular reason why that aspect of her life has been ignored? I think you, as in the, the honeymoon or yeah, the Irish the marriage, the honeymoon. Um, I, I don't, like, 
I think maybe because with the Irish connection, I think it's maybe because to a large extent, herself and her father, who was Irish, did turn their back somewhat on the Irish connection. Okay. Like once he left, he never came back to Ireland mm. again. Um, when she came over, um, you know, when they came on honeymoon, they came to Arthur, who was also an Irish man, and they came to his um, home place in Banhart. But they didn't go north, you know, they didn't go to her roots and that. Um, so that I think that maybe the fact that she didn't big up her Irish connection was how it got lost in the they miss the time to, to, to some extent. And as regards, I don't really have an answer for you as regards why the honeymoon got written out yeah. um, of, of, of history to uh, some extent. Because, you know, what, what I've based, the, the, the premise of the book is based on my understanding from her letters that it was possibly the happiest time of her life. Right, you yeah. Know? yeah. So maybe that doesn't feed in with the kind of the gothic um, nature of the Brontes, you know, sure. they're supposed to be miserable. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. It, it, it certainly is an area that has been ignored, you mm -hmm. know, because I, I was quite surprised. I remember when I was reading what your book was about, you know, sure. before it was published. I thought, oh, I never knew Sharon Bronte came to Ireland on honeymoon, you know, it was yes. news to me. And I would certainly be a fan of the Brontes as well. There but, you go. Yeah, I, I certainly never read that elsewhere. And um, so your novel was also informative for okay. me as well as enjoyable. Um, so Martina, uh, just to go back to my original question to Pauline there, what was it that captured your imagination about Ethan Summerhill? Well, in the first instance, it was because I discovered that after her co-author Violet Martin or Martin Ross, her nom de plume, died, Edith continued writing using the duo signature and convinced herself that she was collaborating beyond the grave with Martin, as she called uh, her collaborator. And there'd be regular seances and daily automatic writing. And I just find this kind of bonkers. But the more I investigated it, the more I saw the benefits of it to Edith. I mean, it was actually a very clever coping strategy because um, Somerville and Ross was a lucrative brand name, but Edith Somerville on her own, well, who knew who, how that would do? And as well, it created a sense of mystery, and mystery is good for business. So it was extremely astute of her, but she did believe that they were collaborating. Now, she inherited all of Martin's papers and diaries and letters. So she was able to go back and look at notes they'd sent each other saying, oh, this is a great idea for a novel, or oh, we should put this character in the book. So the collaboration, I believe, was with the material mm. rather than, you know, table tapping and so forth. But it worked for Edith and kept her going at a time when she'd lost confidence in her ability to write. And you know, writers have all sorts of coping strategies. Mm. You know, I remember one writer who told me she couldn't settle down to work until she washed all the tiles. Um, and I can't really settle down to work until I became that kind of pet of the cat and made myself a pot of coffee. So, you know, we all have our wee ways of managing. Uh, and a seance is perhaps an extreme version of managing, but hey, if it works, don't knock it. Yeah, and you think she believed it? She did. I'm she did believe that she was communing. Well, look, we have to think of the context and mm. the times. She first started getting the wall to move properly uh, in 1916. Martin died in December 1915, and there were several months when she was just totally at sea. And then she began with seances. 1916, what was happening in the world was the Great War. The World War I meat grinder, when a whole generation of young men was wiped out. And people struggled with the notion that they would never again see their husband, their sweetheart, their son, their brother. And so spiritualism um, had a revival then. I mean, it, it had been popular in as well, but it had a revival during World War One, and all sorts of people did it. 
um, including Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, and of course W.B. Yeats famously was um, into spiritualism, and his wife spent their honeymoon not travelling around Ireland like um, Charlotte Bronte and um, Arthur Nichols, but um, doing trance writing or automatic writing. And I suppose in a way trance writing or automatic writing is really your subconscious. Mm. I mean, I, I had a go with it myself just okay. to see what yeah. it was like. And it's just, for me, shopping lists and to do, and I must remember this came out, you know. I just you didn't, didn't hear any voices from no, the other side? No, 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 no I didn't. Okay. <laughs> no. But um, Edith convinced herself she was, and like WB Yeats was convinced. Mm. He was also getting messages. But you know the thing about these messages? They tend to be from Egyptian high priests <laughs> and Charles Dickens. They're not from, yes, you yeah. know, your next door neighbour who died 20 yes, years ago. Yeah, yeah. I loved how you wrote them in the novel as well, Martina, because you kind of wrote them a little bit garbled sometimes, so the message wouldn't come across completely clearly. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, I read some automatic writing in other places and I saw that, that the voice would come through with that. Look, it's very anodyne. It's mm. like your stars, if anyone reads their stars in the newspaper. I, it's my guilty secret. Um, but it, there's an awful lot of uh, just anodyne material. Mm. You know, believe in yourself your work will be successful, the kind of things you need to know. But I noticed with some of them that I find in the archives, suddenly it would be the equivalent of the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog in the middle, or, you know, it would just go a bit off paste. And the other thing about the automatic writing I read is there are no full stops, no capital letters, a bit like some of those letters we get from the public in newspapers, you know, often written in green ink. Um, very random use of upper and lower case, so you kind of look, kind of like mm. this. Um, very interesting to see. And of course, the thing with um, Edith Somerville, and I'm sure Pauline, you find it with um, your Charlotte Bronte material. There's a lot in the archive, and that's a gift mm. to scholars and novelists because with letters and diaries you're reading someone's unexpurgated words. It's a bit like a text message or um, an email now. And in the diary entries in particular, you're seeing people not at their best when they're in a bad mood or venting or showing just human emotions. Whereas even with an autobiography, you've smoothed it all out and you're putting your best foot forward. So with the diary and the letters, you were getting a real sense of yeah. the person, and that's great for fiction. And, and I mean, I noticed with Somerville and Ross and the letters they sent each other and other people, that they had this really colorful grasp of language and they made up words and phrases. And some of the ones that particularly jumped off the page to me were, um, oh, a letters of apology Grovels. If they'd done something they felt they shouldn't, they'd say, "What we to write a grovel? And another thing that Edith used to do was call um, donations to the church bazaar dirts. So she was a very talented artist, and in later life was rather sorry that she hadn't paid more attention to her art. She did illustrate all their work, and there are lots of examples of her art um, formal portraits uh, and landscapes in places like the Crawford Gallery in Cork, but also in Trishan House where she lived for most of her life. Um, they have lovely examples of her work, but people will sometimes bring me um, sketches and watercolours um, that she did, and these were her dirts, and she'd be asked for a donation for a good cause or a church fit, and she say, I did three dirts today. Yeah, yeah. She didn't take herself too seriously okay, in that yeah, sense. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. Um, Pauline, to, to, to continue that thread there, Martina has talked about having access to things like diaries and letters, and how much access did you have to, to personal um, records like that? Sure. Um, well, the, the letters, uh, Charlotte Ponty's letters are in three volumes, and they were put together very helpfully um, by a woman called Margaret Smith. 
and so they were invaluable mm -hmm. to, to, to have them um, and most of those letters um, are to her friend Ellen Nussie okay. so they're, they're quite candid um, you know and they, they they change over time right the letters start in around 1829 and go right up just before her death she wrote the, the last one in February of the year she died mm -hmm. um, and she died in March so and in that letter you know, the, she talks about her husband and sings these praises and says lovely things about mm -hmm. how he's minding her. Um, and that, which is also how I got the idea that she did. She was happy and she did, uh, she did, I think she did love him in that Victorian way. Yeah. Um, but, What's um, that? What's the, Victorian <laughs> that's the Victorian way? Well, that's it's, it's certainly, yeah. I, I, I think it's, I, I think it's based more on respect. You know, that they respected each other as individuals because I think the start, it certainly wasn't a romantic love. They weren't swinging from the shadows. Not at all. Yeah. Um, and I think at the start, you know, she makes no, um, um, she, she makes no, no secret of the fact that um, in her letters she's saying that he's not her intellectual equal. Yes. And she felt that this was going to be a problem, that you know, she wouldn't be able to discuss politics with him, she wouldn't be able to discuss literary things with him. Um, you know, she just saw him as kind of the lonely cleric, um, which is kind of surprising big seeing as that was what her father was as well and he mm -hmm. was like a literary man and um, but that's how she saw him but I think as they you know as we read the letters during the honeymoon and afterwards I think what she found in Arthur was a man who protected her respected her managed her because for the first time at the honeymoon she didn't have to organize the travel he did it all, and this was a first for her. So it was the first time that she wasn't having to do all those things. So I think that the, the, that love that developed between the two of them, I think that's what it was based on. Mm. It was based on, you know, maybe a bit like the, the, the love that existed, you know, in our minds between our parents and our grandparents. You know, I don't think we ever saw them as sexual beings. We just saw this lovely rapport um, between them that kept them together. So maybe that's what I mean by the Victorian yeah. form of love. It's certainly not a derogatory. I'm not, mm. you know, I'm placing it back in, yeah, in, in that territory. I was going to ask you about that because it comes up several times in the novel, the fact that she's really concerned about Arthur not being her intellectual equal. And uh, there's lovely humour in the book, Pauline, where Arthur constantly misquotes uh, sources of literature. And she kind of, we can almost see her rolling her eyes and, you know, she doesn't want to correct him. You know, she's, yeah. she's quite nice about that. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, Which might have been me being a little more nice to Charlotte right. than she might have been in reality because mm -hmm. she was a literary snob. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and, and you know, the, the, they were so well read, you mm. know, in, in terms of considering what was available to them. They read everything that was available to them at the time. And we forget things like that she met Charles Dickens, that she met Thackeray. Yeah. Um, and she, she didn't really, like she uses the expression, she couldn't abide being lionised, you know, so this, you know, being presented as a celebrity. Um, she, she just couldn't be bothered, you know. So, I mean, famously the dinner with Thackeray fell on its backside because she didn't perform. Mm -hmm. She just sat there mutely and decided I couldn't be bothered. You know, right, yeah. nothing to add to these women that are flocking around him and have loads to say. Yeah. But um so yeah I think that you know the, the the relationship between them like he would have you know and we have documentary evidence of this that you know he, he would have read everything that she she she'd written. Mm -hmm. But then he gets this bad rap because um, he asked her to, you know, not write to, to Ellen Lussy first after they were married and if she did that Ellen would burn the letters. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that was a form of protection. Like he referred to her letters as Lucifer's matches because he felt that they, in the wrong hands, mm -hmm. you know, they could uh, tarnish her reputation or people might get the wrong idea. But out of that, a lot of um, criticism 
has you know been railed at him and that maybe that's the reason she censorship absolutely and that yeah. she never wrote again yeah. um, you know but I, I think there was other reasons that she didn't write again and I think one of the reasons maybe that the reason she wrote in the first place was always financial mm. it started with a need to make money yeah yeah I mean, what was the content of these letters that he was so afraid of falling into the wrong hands? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, we don't know. We can only surmise, you know. Well, um, did he we feel do, we do some know some of yes. them? Yeah. yeah. Did yeah. he feel she was too outspoken on certain topics? Absolutely. She, she, she'd say it all, mm -hmm. um, which is a gift for a researcher. Yeah. Um, and that, and particularly, you know, some of the the. They, they extend letters you know, are not kind to him. Mm. You know, the earlier mm. ones that involve um, Elizabeth Gaskell and um, a woman called Kate Wing, Wing, Wingsworth, who she writes to on honeymoon. And I think she writes to her on honeymoon with the express purpose of telling her, I, I've done good. Mm. Because the previous um, conversation with her would have, would have been where she said, I think he could be dull. Okay. And this is months yes. before the yeah. wedding. She's saying, you know, I know he's dull, but mm. well, well, I suppose we, we, we couldn't blame him for not <laughs> wanting people to read that. You know, for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. I think I don't think it was a censorship thing okay. with him. I think it was a protection of her. You know, mm. and I think that's, um, you know, we see that in in the way he conducted his life after Charlotte. Like even though, and I know this is an area that um, Martina is interested in. Even though he went on and he married. Again, the, the house that they lived in became a shrine mm -hmm. to Charlotte, and reputedly his last words were Charlotte, Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it was respect and, and protection mm -hmm. more so than censorship. Sure, yeah. Pauline, would you like to give us a flavour of Charlotte narrator at this point? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, I picked the, the, um, the honeymoon is between Wales and, um, and then Ireland, and they, when they arrive in Ireland, um, we did know some of the places they stayed in, but um, there's nothing to suggest they stayed in the shelter. But I put them into the shelter <laughs> <laughs> because why wouldn't you? Um, and but one of the other things that um, I, I knew about the the Shelburne Hotel um, was that there was a ghost, um, Mary Masters. Um, in the Shelburne and in Charlotte's writing indeed in all of the Bronte writing we have this gothic element so there always is a kind of a ghostly um, element in their writing so I suppose I was determined that I would try and get something of that yeah. into this as well so this is just an extract of when they, the, it's their first night in the Shelburne the room was as cold as winter when Charlotte woke some hours later Arthur slept sound soundly, so rather than move closer for warmth and risk waking him, she rose to get a shawl from her trunk. A light from the street below attracted her attention to the window. The gas lights, at intervals around the black mass that was Stephen's green, dotted the darkness in fairy fashion. As her eyes grew accustomed to the night, the buildings, the tree shapes, and even the still water of the lake in the park, came into focus and were further revealed and the clouds parted, allowing moonlight to flood the cityscape. Faint clip-clopping broke through the silence, the sound rising to a crescendo as the horse and carriage materialised beneath the window and then faded again to quiet as it made its way up the street into nothingness. Apart from the flicker of the lights, the scene was corpse still. Charlotte disliked being a lone observer of the night. Not because of any fear or suggestion that things were anything other than they, what they were during light hours, but because her grief, like a leviathan lying beneath the waters of her unquiet soul, fed on her loneliness, grew strong, rose up and broke through the surface. And as this monster of grief opened its jaws, there they were, huddled inside, all her siblings and her mother, the adult faces ghastly pale and stretched into tortured grimaces, and little Mariah and Elizabeth, who still wore the expressions of innocent youth, had they not looked so sad, could have been deemed to be angels, but surely angels always smiled. Charlotte shivered, drew her shawl in closer, and was making her way back to the bed, when movement from where the washstand was caught her attention. She might have dismissed it for a moth, attracted to the reflection of moonlight in the mirror, if it had not been for the sound of water being poured into a receptacle. 
She leaned towards the burble and the gaping empty circle in the stand where the pitcher and basin should have sat. The room became even colder. She could see in the mirror the clouds closing across the moon and there, there, quick as lightning, there was that movement again, a streak of white that flashed through the darkness. Charlotte wanted to make haste to the bed but found that she was unable to move and in that state of petrification, as she gazed at her shady figure in the mirror, she saw it behind her, standing beside the walnut breakfast table, the pitcher in one hand, the other resting on the basin, and the only thing that kept Charlotte from passing out was the resemblance of the child, for child it was, to her little sister Mariah. It spoke. Have you seen my sister, lady? It said. What's her name? Charlotte answered, expecting to hear her say Elizabeth. The child poured water from the pitcher. She rolled up the sleeves of what to Charlotte looked like the dress Mariah was wearing when Papa came and took her home from Cowan Bridge, the last time Charlotte saw her older sister. Instead of answering, the little thing began to hum as she washed her hands. What is your name? Charlotte asked, her curiosity and keenness to determine if this was Mariah's spirit displacing any horror such an apparition should normally conjure up in the haunted. Mary, the child said momentarily interrupting her humming. Don't you mean Mariah? Charlotte said, continuing to address the mirror. Mary, the child repeated. Mariah, Charlotte said. Mary, Mariah, Mary, Mariah. Charlotte, Charlotte, come back to bed. It was Arthur. He gently guided her back to the bed, took the shawl from her shoulders and settled her under the covers. <coughs> and before he had reached his side of the bed, she was once more asleep. Lovely. Thanks very much, Pauline. And that was a lovely insight there before you read, just telling us about the ghost of the shell burn and the fact that, okay, they, they didn't stay there, but you decided this would be an interesting element of the story and it would be an opportunity to introduce the Gothic, which sure. the Brontes loved. Um, and obviously, when people write historical fiction, they are saying it's fiction. They're not saying everything in this book happened, everything in this book is true. It's, it's not biography. Um, and we always wonder, of course, what's true and what's not true. Yes. <laughs> and um, to, to what extent did you feel free to introduce fiction into the story? Um, you know, how much of the novel is fact? Yeah, well, I would like. I would say most of it is fact. Mm -hmm. That there are, you know, the the places they went certainly are based on the letters. Um, I I brought them just to one place that isn't documented in the letters, and that was Skibbereen. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I brought them to Skibbereen is because I wanted to introduce an aspect of the famine. It was eighteen fifty four, so the famine was still being felt. Um, around Ireland and particularly in Skibbereen. Um, so I wanted to you know, bring that, that aspect of it in and also to um, showcase that, that, that there was a very charitable sign to Charlotte and she was known you know, for almsgiving um, in her duties as the daughter of the clergyman. Um, so, so we had to bring that part in. But you know, the, 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 the places, I remember Hilary Mantel, um, rest in peace so recently um, that I remember she said with historical fiction um, that the, the aspect of it that you're, you're fictionalising is what they thought. Yeah. That you know a lot of the time you have what they said, you have what they did but you don't know what they thought. So that's where I had the, the most freedom mm -hmm. in it was what was she thinking. You know I knew the places she went, I knew what she was saying in the letters but I had fun with how she yeah. might have been thinking, and particularly thinking about uh, Arthur, thinking about Ireland, um, and thinking about her relatives, mm -hmm. um, because her, her, you know, her, um, she, she wasn't always complimentary about Ireland in her fiction, mm -hmm. particularly in Villette. Um, and yeah, maybe there was part of me, the Irish patriot in me, that wanted to undo that yeah. to a certain extent. But the, the, the Shelburne um, was a fiction, where they stayed in Kilkee wasn't a fiction, where they stayed in Wales wasn't a fiction, and where they stayed in Banagher um, wasn't either. But, um, but I did have fun with Killarney as well. Mm -hmm. The Great Southern had just opened a month before. So. 
I had to put them there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> terrific. Thanks a lot, Pauline, um, for giving us those insights into Charlotte and Arthur. Um, Martina, I'll ask you the same question, actually, um, because it all felt very real to me as I read Edith. Um, what would the balance be between fact and fiction in the novel? Well, I suppose Nilo O'Connor's description of it is the best. They're probable possibles. Mm. So it's what's likely and believable. Um, I mean, I know I became very conscious of the previous historical fiction novel about the Titanic ship of dreams where I realised I cannot move the iceberg out of the way. Mm -hmm. The ship has to hit that iceberg. So that's often why, as a novelist, you include fictional characters along with the real characters because you can't change outcomes mm -hmm. for people who actually lived. You can for fictional characters. Um, but in terms of the balance, um, I, mean, I, I haven't really got a spreadsheet or yeah. a line chart. <laughs> um, you just try and put as much real, authentic detail in as possible to make it believable. Sometimes you think to yourself, oh, I can use their actual words because here they are in a diary mm -hmm. or a letter. But often they clunk, yeah. particularly to modern ears. So you can't really go down that road. Mm -hmm. but you can pick up on details that you come across and include them and actually a true detail that I came across from research from reading books like On Another Man's Wound by Ernie O'Malley which is perhaps the best of those contemporary books about the Civil War and War of Independence, the Revolutionary Period. Um, a detail I picked up from one of those books was one that my editor said, oh you have to take that out, that's just not believable. And you come across that again and mm. again, and I left it in, in fact. But, yeah. um, and that was uh, the detail, if you're interested, was that there was a rumour going around during the War of Independence that somewhere in Kerry, where else, had been spotted a tricolour butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and the local people were very heartened by that and thought it was a sign nature the natural world was in harmony with um, aspirations towards national independence. Mm. Mm. So those details um, are important, I think. Uh, and then, as Pauline says, thoughts are something that as a novelist you're free yeah. to imagine, but again within the bounds of possibility and probability. And when you read enough of um, someone's work, particularly their letters, not so much their novels, you become familiar with their thought processes. And I mean, for me, it's I try and think myself into that character and become that character. It's easier with some characters than others. I mean, I do not come from an ascendancy class background. I didn't grow up in a big house. But, you know, you can imagine how someone is feeling if an IRA flying column in their house and mm -hmm. they're all herded into the kitchen and told to hand over what they have. Like yeah. you can imagine. You've that. actually preempted my next question. Oh, I was going to ask, did that happen? Yes, yeah. the, yes, yeah. yes. The, an IRA flying column did come into the house mm -hmm. and uh, took horses and they were looking for weapons and for money as well and valuables that could be sold. And actually there was another detail there that I came across reading lots of um, accounts from various big houses about these um, uh, incursions by the flying columns, which was that sometimes the uh, the IRA captain would make a list of the objects that were taken from the house, you know, candlesticks and yeah, which he does, which he does, and then they'd say, you know, um, you know when when uh, Ireland is a, a, a nation, we, uh, you know, hand this in and you'll be refunded. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, I laughed at that on the one hand, but on the other hand, I, thinking myself into that IRA captain's mind, mm -hmm. was this idea that they weren't robbers to them, you know, and that they were, that this was for the nation and that they would refund it. Um, 
I don't know if that ever happened. Uh, it was after the period of my novel, you know, that would have been later in the 20s, uh, and this is set in 1921, 1922, and I would have gone down a rabbit hole if I then started going into the military archives and checking, did they get their money for the, for the, the candlesticks, which were donated. Yeah. Um, main thing was guns, actually, you know, guns were wanted. Um, ammunition and so people in the big houses were encouraged to hand in their guns and so forth to the, the, uh, the RIC barracks and they did but sometimes they didn't want to hand in little you know personal pistols mm -hmm. and um, fancy swords that an ancestor had used in the Crimea or wherever. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to read from either to first now Martina? Of course. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Just to put it in context um, the piece I thought I'd read is when she is in Britain, um, uh, staying with George Bernard Shaw and his wife Charlotte. And Charlotte Shaw was originally Charlotte Payne Townsend and a, and a cousin, uh, not a first cousin. They just called each other cousins the whole time. And I was like, well, is it a first cousin? What? Um, uh, but she was a, a kind of a cousin of Edith's, and they would have known each other as girls. And, um, Edith was savvy enough. When she wrote a, a play based on the Irish RM stories, um, began in 1921, was still working on it in 1922. Um, and she thought, well, who do I know in the theatre world then who can help me get this play put on? She was ambitious, even though it was her first real professional play. She went straight to the top and thought, well, I'll get George Bernard Shaw. And so she sent the play to Charlotte, who, as Edith intended, showed it to Shaw. And then in the archive, I find this really, really um, candid letter from Shaw saying, "Give up your license." Um, you know, it's quite scathing. It's, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought, "Oh, that is so mean." But then I find the play during my PhD research. In fact, there are multiple versions of the play because she became obsessed with it and kept rewriting it over a 17-year period. It was called Fleury's Wedding, Fleury Knox, one of the characters in the Irish Isle stories. And um, it was fascinating to read the iterations because in the early version, Sally Knox, Fleury's love interest, is riding about the countryside on a horse but in the final version, she drives up in a chauffeur-driven <laughs> car and she's taken up smoking, which was more acceptable. So you know, Edith goes and stays with Shaw and Charlotte uh, and he's, he, he does this happened. He did give her advice on cutting the play, which clearly she didn't take enough of, um, having read the, the you know, later versions. And, uh, He's uh, at that time working on his opus, Magnus, which is um, St. John. Um, so they're talking, they're at dinner and they're talking about automatic writing. And Shaw quizzes her on spiritualism, asks her why she does it. It helps me to navigate my life. Sounds like tomfoolery and worse. The vulnerable and recently bereaved are exploited. I'm not the exploitable type. I'd like to try automatic writing, says Charlotte. A parlour game for the susceptible. It occurs to Edith that he's amusing himself with her as a cat toys with a mouse. Two can play at that game. She pivots to her cousin. We can try some automatic writing after dinner, if you like, Lottie. Would you care to join us, George? Certainly not. It's the unconscious mind at work, and of my own unconscious, I am, naturally, unconscious. <laughs> Do you really speak to the dead, Edith? asks Charlotte. The so-called dead? Of course I do. The messages are part of a repressed personality. Then perhaps useful for self-discovery, darling. If you were drunk, would you say it was the real you emerging? 
How can a trance be any more true? It's self-delusion. What a poppycock. Darling, you've been dreadfully cranky. Having now reached the age of Methuselah, I'm entitled to be cranky. Edith happens to know she's six months younger than Sean. But I'm a mere man. What do I know of any afterlife? I shall turn in and read some notes on Joan of Arc's trial. Good night, ladies. Don't let me stop you playing with ghosts. So on your own heads, be it. Shaw's departure sucks all the energy from the room. Edith and Charlotte have a stab at automatic writing, but make no progress. Privately, Edith thinks Shaw has put his evil eye on it. If he wanted to commune with the spirit world, they'd have been table tapping into the wee small hours. They decide on an early night. The next morning, Edith reworks her play and later picks Shaw's brains for theatrical contacts. He tells her on no account should the play be submitted before it's ready. Redrafting, followed by further redrafting, is essential. Take me, Edith. I've been thinking and reading about Joan of Arc since her canonization the year before last. I hope able to translate my French peasant girl to the stage, but there are no guarantees. The maid continues to resist me. Better no play than a shoddy one. Remember that. The hotter the work, the sooner the finish, says Edith, or so our housemaid Philomena insists. Once the English might have liked that little gem, says Shaw. Not now. We're in their black books. <laughs> Thank you. So, Joan Shaw says the maid continues to resist me. Mm. Did either at any point resist you, Martina? Oh, your subjects always resist you at times, generally at the halfway point. Of course they resist you. I mean, I would resist me. <laughs> Somebody's coming along rummaging in yeah. my life, you know. I mean, it is, you do have to accept when you choose real people for a fictional subject that you are doing something quite unseemly. Mm -hmm. You know, you are having a good old rummage and you're coming across things about them that maybe you shouldn't share and those sort of things that should really go in your book. Yeah. So, yes, she resisted me. But I grew very fond of her. Now, I didn't always like everything about her. She was a crashing snob. She was so proud of her lineage um, that she could be somewhat unkind to people who couldn't trace their family back on teen generations. Um, and she liked the country people, but, you know, uh, she disliked the middle classes. Mm -hmm. But the middle classes were the people who were buying up the land that the uh, ascendancy class needed to sell to keep their houses on the go. And were in fact even buying these houses. So they were threatened by the middle classes. Whereas they um, you know they 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 felt they were they could talk to the country people. And of course, the country people were very useful to Somerville and Ross because of the colour of their language. And they'd write it all down. You know, in their notebooks, you can see examples. One that sticks in my mind, and I was able to use it, was she asked a, a train guard, um, would he look after her little, her little dog in the uh, kind of cargo carriage? her doglings, as she called them, that was another of her words. And he said, Mrs. Twill be as safe as if it was in God's own pocket. Um, and they loved the colour of the vernacular, which was often, you know, just transposed straight from the Irish. Uh, and they admired that. And they also loved court cases. And they'd be seen at the assizes and skibbering, scribbling away. And you can find, if you track it, actual newspaper reports of cases. Um, versions of them then are then in the Irish RM stories and very thinly disguised characters. And 
sometimes names are in there as well, so you can see where they're getting their ideas from. Yeah. And when I was a young newspaper reporter, I remember being told, if you want to see life in the raw and what it's really like, go to a court case, you know, all the stories mm. are there and human emotion. One other thing that occurs to me about her when Pauline was talking about the letters, she was reading Charlotte's letters, um, I, I was able to read uh, Edith's own handwriting, with rears in the book rather than handwriting. Well, you could read the handwriting as yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is impossible because it's so small. It's tiny, yeah. isn't it? But Edith's I could read and also because she was an artist, she'd um, have little illustrations down the side, which is lovely, and you'd often come across just a little pen or pencil drawing of one of her dogs or um, just scribbles. Um, she, they knew Oscar Wilde. I mean, they were very connected and knew everybody. Mm -hmm. Sir William Wilde, Oscar's father, was a neighbour of Violet Martin's in Galway. He had a small estate there. So they knew Oscar and they didn't really like him. But uh, mostly because he was editing a magazine at the time and he didn't commission them. They were a bit of a huff about that, which is fair enough. Um, but one of her letters to Violet Martin had a, a little, she said, Oh, I, was, I saw Oscar Wilde in the street today and um, he was walking along with his hand outstretched, carrying a single lily as though his precious cargo, and she drew a bit of scribble of that mm. for Martin to see. Mm, interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. The artwork is fascinating to look at. I mean, actually some of her best art is of the country people, you know, mm. those cranky faces. Has it been exhibited? Yes, yeah. she had two exhibitions mm. late in life, in the 1920s, so she was born, you know, she was a Victorian lady, she would, uh, let me work it out, so she would have been in her 60s then, yeah. and uh, so a very successful exhibition in London in the 20s, and then later uh, an exhibition in New York, and both were sellouts, but I think probably they were being bought on her reputation as a writer more than an, yeah. an artist. Sir so John Lavery did go though and admired her use of colour, mm -hmm. and she painted all her life. I mean, she earned her first money at the age of 16, designing greetings cards, and then she won money soon after um, for a competition to draw a bicycle in just a few lines. So she loved art, and it was it was her first passion. But her life changed when she met. Violet Martin in her 20s, even though they were second cousins, they hadn't met before. And uh, Violet Martin was very focused on becoming a writer. And um, she persuaded Edith that they would work together, collaborate. And uh, I think that's largely the reason why Edith did. Um, they were great friends and they had the best fun together. They traveled. You see, bear in mind at that time, before Violet Martin came along, when Edith wanted to travel, she had to go with one of her male cousins or brothers. Mm -hmm. She had one um, term, or was it a year, I forget which, but a brief time at um, in Alex in Dublin at school. She, she had governesses other than that. But when she went to school for that very short period, they had a chaperone, mm -hmm. you know? So um, when Martin came along, they were able to travel together. Yeah. You know, it, it was safer to ladies on their mm -hmm. own. Uh, sorry, you know, they could do it. Sure, and, yeah. Um, so they wrote travel books as well. Journalism, travel books, Edith did children's books. One, one children's book, um, and then she wrote another which wasn't published. I love her children's okay. books. They are, and she did the artwork as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I can see why it perhaps didn't sell as well mm -hmm. as she hoped, because as a Victorian lady, they believed in morality tales and you know, um, hard knocks for bold children. And it's, um, it's about a little elephant, a naughty little elephant, which well, doesn't do as its parents tell it. And a tiger bites its trunk off. And you're reading and thinking, okay, but this will end well. Okay, this isn't going to happen. No, I know he's with stripes, the tiger, but it's, this isn't going down that road. 
and D&D, you know, the last image is yeah. of, you know, this little bleeding blood. Dear, dear. Blood and, and um, yes, the publishers really would, even at that time, yeah. the publishers yeah. would have liked to toned down. So she then did another children's book about um, a crocodile king. And I thought, oh, this is feminist. This is really right on because the crocodile king is sitting on the eggs. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, things end badly. Uh, uh, a child is eaten and the mother uh, takes her revenge um, by, you know, breaking all the eggs and killing all the little baby crocodiles. And it just goes, I mean, it's, you know, Stephen King territory, really. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And, uh, so that one didn't get published, but the artwork is amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, she was a talented artist, and towards the end of her life, she said she was sorry she didn't pay more attention to it. But look, right. she has yeah. a great body of work, mm -hmm. you know, in the Irish RM stories, which still stand the test of time. There are three collections. And also, you know, the real Charlotte, which is, has been described as perhaps one of the best Victorian novels. Yeah. And um, my personal favourite, which is The Big House of Inver, which Edith wrote on her own after mm. um, Violet Martin's death. So she was able to work on her own. And, and these, these female bonds are, are very important, I think, to, to both your work um, as regards to the bond with, with Martin is, is a more explicit one. But in, in your book, Pauline, you also talk about the trouble she had, the trouble Charlotte had writing after Anne and Emily were sure. dead and, yes. and she felt, you know, can I do this yeah. without my sisters to discuss my work with and, yeah. you know. It was quite the collaboration I and mean, yeah. it was almost, their working lives were nearly what we would call workshops yeah. now. Yeah. They, they sat together, they wrote together, they, they read out their, their work, they walked around the table in the parsonage um, as well. So, and, and they'd been doing that, you know, they have a body of juvenilia mm. as well. So they had been doing that famously since the box of toy soldiers had arrived. Um, their father brought them as a present to Branwell, the only brother. And um, the four of them, you know, got a soldier each and out of that grew two um, Charlotte collaborated with Branwell on the tales of Angria and Emily and Anne on the tales of Gondo. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, so they were writing together as a family, which is part of what makes them so uh, strange and literary, mm -hmm. literary, you know, phenomenon yeah. is how they were all, you know, Branwell was more the artist than the writer, but he did write as well and mm -hmm. famously wrote um, two words for us, I think it was. The, she sent him a letter and his poems, which didn't go anywhere, but he had notions yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to write as well. But yeah, cer certainly it was very much um, collaboration between them. And Charlotte afterwards, she, she struggled. She struggled with her mental health as well um, when they, they died, because they died within um, 13 months of each other. You know, first Branwell, then Emily, then Anne. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, what had been a very busy house became herself and an old man. Um, so the the novel that she was writing at the time was was Shirley, and and then the the last novel that she wrote, um, Villette. Like there's um, a scene in Villette where the Lucy Snow, the main character, um, has a mental breakdown, and that is autobiographical. Okay. Yeah. Um, from Charlotte's point of view, so, so yeah, and yeah. I, I think lived probably the, the the writing the writing experience for her at the end was probably a very lonely experience and not a very pleasant one mm. either. Mm. Um, there was no joy in it, and I think that's part of the reason why once um, Arthur came on the scene, that was the end of the writing. There was a um, a, a small fragment of a novel was left, which. Um, Claire Boylan took and turned it into the novel Emma Brown, okay. um, you know, continued writing it as, as she imagined Charlotte was going with it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And, and also in your novel, when you talk about this, this, I suppose, a type of writer's block, I mean, she's grieving. I mean, who would write in those circumstances, having lost all their siblings in such a short space of time? Um, but 
you know, clearly I would imagine she would have preferred not to have to write under a pseudonym, but it was the pseudonym that actually helped her in some ways, at least that's how I read it when I was reading the novel, that when she became her girl, um, she picked up the pen and she just wrote. Sure. She was no longer Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the pseudonyms for all of them was just to have pseudonyms that were andro androgynous, you know, mm. that they would not identify them as women, and that was a ploy to get published, you know, and it worked. Um, famously, so that when um, people were beginning to say there were one person yes. that was writing um, The Tenant of Wildfield Hall, Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre, Charlotte and Anne presented themselves to their publishers in London mm -hmm. saying Emily wouldn't go, um, which is no surprise. Um, Emily was not very sociable at all, but they went and presented themselves to prove that there was more than one person writing yes. these novels. So the, the, the pseudonym was, was a, a, a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, as a lot of women, you know, um, Marianne Evans, George Eliot, mm -hmm. um, you know, the same thing, you know, to just emasculate their names so that they yeah. get published yeah. Terrific. And, and accepted as well yeah. by their reading public. Yeah, yeah, it was just a necessity in those times. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Although well, Mrs. Gaskell was able to use her yeah. own name. But Mrs. Mrs. Gaskell. But Mrs. Gaskell. So Mrs. Yeah. Mrs. Gaskell, yeah. Gaskell yeah. not Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'd like to just open questions to the floor. Does anybody have any questions for, for Pauline or Martina? Yes. Yeah. I would like to ask, what, uh, were they allowed to? So were some of Roland Ross lovers? Yeah. Like, I, I, I just got a, a book a couple of years ago called, I think, 20th century, uh, 19th and 20th century Irish artists. And it was just so obvious that they had all carefully avoided attaching themselves mm. to a man, but that an awful lot of the time they attached themselves to a woman. And I mean, one was obviously to avoid uh, any kind of, you know, like their lives were just taken over by children if they, mm. if they did that. But uh, it's often been said about... It's been speculated, hasn't it? It has. Well, we can't really know. Yeah. You know, we can't go into the bedroom and see where they are not. Certainly they gave each other great emotional support and there was great affection there and Char um, um, yeah, I'm saying Charlotte, Edith, I'm so interested in, in what Paul <laughs> was saying about Charlotte. Edith grieved uh, really all her life for Martin as she called her. Um, I don't, I'm not convinced that they were practicing lovers if you like. Yeah. I kind of think well you're looking at the evidence, and that's all you can do, and then make your own mind up. And I leave it open in the novel. I certainly don't put her in bed with her, mm -hmm. because I felt that that's a big thing to do if you don't 100% believe it, okay? But yeah. that's just my interpretation no, no, I mean, that's someone, else, that's someone else might yeah. have another one. No, but I, I really felt that they had this passionate friendship. It was, and, and we have, what we have to remember is women at that time did have passionate friendships, and we can sometimes misconstrue it today because we're looking at it through today's prism. But I do know, for example, that um, Edith wanted, had a number of proposals of marriage and wanted to accept at least one of them, but her parents vetoed it because they felt that the young man didn't have enough money to keep her in you know, the manner, etc., etc. And it was one of the cruelties of those times and that class that they would prefer for their um, sisters or daughters not to have their own household and the opportunity to have children. You know, they were afraid that the family would fall down a social scale and they would prefer for them not to have that. Yes. And, and, and that was why her parents refused to give permission. So we do know that she did love a man and wanted to marry him. That doesn't preclude you yeah. know, a relationship yeah. with Martin. Um, but I just didn't see any hard evidence mm -hmm. of it. And I feel that the servants would have spoken about it in Castle Towns and if they yeah. had to shared a room mm -hmm. together. I mean, they lived together in later life after uh, Martin's mother died. Um, you know, she was always welcome in Trisham House and she did go after about 1906. 
she died in 1915, so she did spend the latter years there. They had separate bedrooms. Now again, you can sneak around in the night if you yeah. like, but I think the servants would have talked about it, and I never came across any of that. So all I'm saying is, I don't know. Yes. Who. Um, and I thought possibly not. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Just a rather strange to know the round table the sheet. I think you mentioned that the famine. Did you really have much information about what was going on in Ireland? Well, she, Charlotte was a, a, an avid newspaper reader. She kept up to date with everything, but um, I'd say the wars in Europe would have preoccupied them more than yeah. the, the famine in Ireland, but she, she was aware. Yeah. Um, this book was written in 1847, say Jane Eyre, whatever. Yes, so, uh, yes. So she's kind of famished, she becomes famished and she goes up to the That's East. That's right. So I was wondering, was there yeah, any yeah. inspiration there? Yeah, I, I, I would imagine, in, in particular, I think, even with Wuthering Heights and the character of Heathcliff, who is, an, you know, we can take it that he was picked up in the streets of Liverpool as an immigrant. And I think that's a, a nod to the amount, the influx of yeah. Irish people into um, England at that time, you know. So, so yes, the, but, but you're right, there's, there's a, the, the, that sense of um, um, hunger yeah. is in it is in the three books yeah. that were written. I was just wondering how like now they read like YouTube and Sky News so they wonder how much do they actually know what was going on or yeah, was they, it more removed. They, they re she read the papers and the papers yeah. came into the parsonage and um, so she she was very up to speed on, on political affairs at the time. So yeah, she would have been very that's aware she did. Pardon? Yes, that's yeah, exactly. Are there a couple of Brontes buried in Donegal? I don't know. Is <laughs> the answer to that? There, I mean, they're not. They, they. Um, Maybe it's not the family. Are you family. thinking of the Austin, Jane Austin. Austin's yeah. family? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, the the Brontes who, you know, Patrick Bronte or Patrick Bronte is yeah. uh, County Down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. Okay, Pauline and Martina, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been thank fascinating you. discussing the books with you. Thank you.